Hello and welcome to Minter Dialogue, episode number 438. My name is Minter Dial and I'm your host for this podcast. A proud member and new at that, the Evergreen Podcast Network. For more information or to check out other shows on the network, please visit evergreenpodcasts.com. So this week's interview is with Dory Clark. Dory is a highly reputed author, consultant and keynote speaker who teaches executive education at Duke University's Fuqua School of Business and Columbia Business School. She's the author of Entrepreneurial You, Reinventing You and Stand Out, which was named the number one leadership book of the year by Inc. Magazine. Dory has been named as one of the top 50 business thinkers in the world by Thinkers 50 and was recognized as the number one communication coach in the world by the Marshall Goldsmith Leading Global Coaches Awards. Her latest book is The Long Game, how to be a long-term thinker in a short-term world. In this conversation, we discuss Dory's own journey, her documentary film, the work toward making her Broadway musical, as well as some of the core concepts in her new book, including good multitasking. You'll find all the show notes on minterdial.com. Please do consider to drop in your rating and review, and don't forget to subscribe to catch all the future episodes. Now for the show with Dory. Dory Clark, back on the show. Listen, uh, another book, another show. Is that that's, there's some there's some Broadway show, another musical, another show, um, uh, in Philly, Boston, or Baltimore. Um, you've got this new book out, The Long Game, and I really enjoyed reading it, Dory. Uh, it's refreshing because so much of what we do, of course, seems to be sh- short term oriented. We're pressed for time. My question for you to start off is why and for whom did you write The Long Game? So in writing The Long Game, I guess for almost any book, it starts with something we're grappling with ourselves. But the immediate impetus was for the past five years, basically since I wrote my last book, Entrepreneurial You, I have been spending a lot of time with creating an online course and community called Recognized Expert. And the members are, there's you know 600 people plus who have gone through the program, but it's professionals who are really looking to get, get their ideas heard, grow a bigger platform, be able to make a bigger difference. And as a result of both my own experience building my business years ago, but also seeing such a wide swath of people, I came to realize something that is hard to see when you're just looking at yourself and your own experience, which is what are the patterns? What are the the common challenges that people experience in the path to getting, getting your ideas out there into the world? And I realized that a really common problem is that, you know, we all know that success doesn't happen overnight, but nobody ever tells us what not overnight means or what you should expect or what it that process looks like in all the detours. And I wanted to create a framework for people with the long game to help to help people think that through because I think a lot of folks get discouraged sometimes and honestly give up too quickly on great ideas because there's often uh, a, a lag in terms of, the period between deciding to do something and actually getting that result. And it can feel long. It can feel demoralizing. It can feel like you're not succeeding along the way. And that's oftentimes it's not true. Oftentimes it's just that progress is slower than we want it to be. And so I really wanted to encourage great people to be able to continue doing great things. And that's why I wrote the long game. Beautiful. It, it really seems that it, it's, it's juggling a number of things where on the one hand you you might need to or know that it's a long game but you have the short term issues and and then then the question then becomes well a obviously you need pragmatic and pay bills but then how do you define success because if you your bills are because i have a 5000 meter townhouse in the middle of new york well okay now I see why there's pressure for that, but is that you? And is that what is success for you? 
Yeah, ultimately, that's the question, right? How, how are we defining it? What are we optimizing toward? And so often, if we don't really interrogate carefully what we want, we end up with these defaults from society, or we end up with the defaults of what our parents wanted for us or what the people around us are doing. I mean, literally just this morning, I was talking to a coaching client of mine, and she was saying that she didn't she didn't love social media. She didn't enjoy it. She wasn't even sure what the value of it was, but she said, oh, but I'm posting every day because that's what the people around me are doing. And I think, you know, we, we talked about this and we actually ultimately decided on a different path for her, but this is something that so many people uh, face where if you're not really sure what that North star is, um, oftentimes it's not a bad heuristic to say, well, okay, what, what's everyone else doing? I guess I'll do that. But there's also the possibility that you could be led astray, sometimes really astray by it. So we need, I think in, in a lot of ways to go back to first principles. I mean, in the long game, I tell the story about a woman named Sarah who is an attorney and she became an attorney specifically. She was, she was also an artist on the side. And she became an attorney because she said, okay, this is a really practical way that I could help other artists. I can help them with intellectual property. I can help, you know, help them just with creating a better business infrastructure so that they can make a living doing their art. And sure enough, after she graduated from arts, uh, from law school, she got a job at a regular law firm where she didn't work with artists at all. And she was doing real estate transactions and contracts and you know all these things that had nothing to do with the reason that she got into being an attorney. And she had an epiphany at a certain point that if she didn't choose to make a change, she was just going to be swept down the path of, okay, here's your law firm career. And she would really get separated from that original goal. And so in her case, she actually made a very impressive brassy move. Uh, this was over a decade ago, and Etsy was a very small online craft site. And she cold called the chief executive, got a meeting with him, and was able to convince him to hire her as the general counsel. They did not have an attorney up to that point uh, because she knew that that was the way that she could actually get back to her original vision of helping other artists. And in fact, she ended up working there for nearly a decade. But um, for a lot of us, we do get swept up in the path in sort of the, the traditional stream of how things are done. And it, it can take us off course at times. And there's so many things that it brings up, Dory. As, as we started at the top, it was about who is this for? And, and, a lot of the time I work with leaders in big companies and we're trying to figure out how to get the, the purpose, the efficiencies of the big companies. And it, and it's often done in abstraction of the, the reality of the individuals, the CMO, the CEO. We don't want to talk about their personal North star. We're trying to develop the North star of the organization and getting the, the team together and team productivity optimizing, as you say, for efficiencies and productivity, as opposed to optimizing for purpose, meaning, and as and this other expression you have, optimizing for interesting. So, I, I you know that was for me my my the word the journey that I had as I was reading your book, looking at it, typically from a corporate standpoint, needing to dig in on as an individual. So this attorney, perfect example, Sarah, who's an attorney working in a large organization. Of course, the end result is she quit the big company and, and then did her thing, well, and moved into another company, Etsy, to mash, mesh her North Star with her professional abilities. So the question I, I'm frequently asked myself is, how does one come up with this North Star idea and, and was interesting one of the conduits for you, Dory, personally, to get into your own North Star. Yeah, so you're touching on something important. For some people, you know, like Sarah, they're clear from the beginning. Oh, I want to, I want to help other artists, and so you, great. If you know that, then do more of that. But for a lot of people, especially successful, busy people that may have, frankly, just been heads down for a really long time, 
if you From try to, to sometimes, sometimes, yes, that's really true. And if you say, well, you know, what, what are you interested in? What's your passion? Which of course, uh, certainly in the United States is kind of the, the question that everybody throws around. And, and frankly, there's a lot of shame among people if they don't know the answer. It's like, oh God, I don't know what my passion is. I guess I'll just sit here in the corner and not do anything until I figure out what my passion is, which is, I think, not the way to figure out what your passion is. Um, but I, I think honestly, we get hung up in it. We get hum, hung up in the phraseology because what's your passion seems to imply that there is, there's one answer that's like, okay, well, you know, here's, here's your soulmate. And the truth is it's often a lot more complicated. Um, interest, you know, interesting people often have lots of interests. So limiting yourself is not helpful. And also we often really don't even know the answer to that until we learn by doing. And so that's why, as you mentioned, Minter, I have a concept that I share in my book, The Long Game, which is called Optimize for Interesting. And the basic idea there is that, you know, this this originally came from a documentary film that I was directing and, and our protagonist had uh, a conversation she related with her mother from the day that she went off to college. And her mother said, you know, her last advice was, whenever you have a choice of what to do, choose the more interesting option. And that really stuck with me. And it helps me understand that, you know, it's not that we have to have the perfect or the perfectly optimized option, you know, the choose your passion uh, option. Ultimately, it's just, you know what, does this seem interesting? Okay, great. Let's do it. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be a life changing decision that we feel like we have to agonize over for, you know, for 300 days. It's basically like, oh, does this seem cool? Let's check it out. And if it keeps seeming interesting, we do more of it. And if it stops being interesting, no problem, do something else. That is how we actually learn. And that is how we actually get traction. Yeah. So you're talking in your documentary film about uh, Marion Stoddart, right? And a and, uh, great uh, story that you talk about that within in the film. And, and I've, I've gone and checked it out. A lovely, lovely documentary is showing that uh, if you follow your path of interesting, you can end up doing big things, a thousand, a thousand things or a thousand people's work with one person, right? One person's idea. Um, and what I liked about that, Dory, is that it's sort of a path towards finding your north. What might be less obvious is, all right, I like this interesting stuff, is making that connecting tissue or, or connecting into what's interesting. Because, oh, that that's interesting. But how, how does one determine lightweight interest, interest that other people find interesting, you know, like social media posting or whatever? Oh, yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, you know, like I, I'm thinking of somebody who goes into uh, the mat and looks at a painting. Um, yeah, that's very interesting. You know, like there's this, that's what you're supposed to say, interesting. So talk us through how to move into the North Star that allows you then to dominate what you want to do. Yeah. Well, you know, there's, there's a couple of interesting things, actually, a, a colleague uh, named James Altucher has what I think sure. is a, a good, uh, a good framework. Uh, he likes to say, if you went into a bookstore, and you were somehow required to read all of the books on a certain shelf, which would you pick? And I, lo I love that as an idea, you know, it's kind of the, the, the idea of like, all right, you know, if you, if you were essentially forced to do whatever it is, 100, 500 hours, who knows, of homework in a particular area, what is the place that would feel exciting for you and not like, oh my God, I can't believe it. Like I have to read about birds for 500 hours. Like, you know, that, that is not fun. If you're not into birds, you know, very clearly like, oh God, why, you know, but if, if somebody, if, if it becomes like, oh, I get to read every book on this shelf. Uh, that's, that's kind of a, a nicer way to figure out where there's a little bit of frisson or where there's a natural attraction. And so I love that. And of course, another thing that, that we can, you know, go back to is, you know, just th thinking about where, where we started, you know, when, when, uh, when you were a kid, what were you interested in? And also, uh, I am always a big fan, you know, I think this is, this is true with calendars, right? We hear sometimes like, you know, look, look at your calendar and I'll show you your priorities. 
Well, similarly, when we think about finding our passion or finding our North Star, you know, however we want to put it, I really like the question, when you have free time, when you are not obligated to be doing something, what is it you're doing? You know, I mean, people, people are relatively self-interested. And so in those moments where we have complete discretion, odds are you're doing something that you find enjoyable. And, you know, if we trace that back, I mean, it's very clear. Some people go to concerts all the time. Whenever they have a chance, they go to, you know, hear live music being played. Um, Some people are always super interested in food and, oh my God, did you hear the new Filipino place opened? And it's the, you know, the special chef who used to be at blah, blah, blah restaurant. Like they know all of it. Like that is obviously an area of interest to them. And they might not have any understanding of like how they could monetize it, but it's, it's a starting point about, oh, this is something that probably more than the norm you are interested in. And that is a direction that might be worth exploring. And then the, the challenge, uh, by the way, I, I, on James Altucher's, uh, I have a little a riff, which is a little bit different, which is go to a magazine store and then look at what you look at. Of course, if you look for the triple X uh, porn session, that's a, another gig. But um, yeah, well, there's money to be made in that too, Minter. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, and the idea of then figuring out to connect the stuff. Because once you've identified what you're interested in, then it, you need to move into uh, something firmer to allow you to navigate. I like food, but then what? And I was wondering for Dory Clark, uh, how, what, what do, do you have a North Star that's written down? How do you, is, is there something that's precise like that? Or is it something that's just sort of ingrained in you? You know, I, I don't, uh, some people have, you know, the, like a, a mission statement or something like that. And I, I have never uh, created anything like that, although I think it's cool. I, I respect that. I feel like I have had a much more iterative process in terms of figuring out my own career trajectory. And it, it frankly gives me a lot of sympathy for people who are mm-hmm. struggling to figure it out. Because for me, I was I was in that boat for a long time. Um, when I first started my business, which now was 15 years ago, I felt like people were like negging me all the time <laughs> because they would ask this question, which I understand is a very, uh, is, is a fine question. It's a legitimate, helpful question. They were asking because they wanted to be helpful. They'd say things like, so who are your ideal clients? And, you know, in my head, I'm like, why are you persecuting me and demanding this information? This is very I triggering. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> And so, you know, it, it obviously it's an easy it's an easy question to answer if you know the answer. And you know, right? They want to know because they want to help you. They want to refer you. That's fantastic. But it can be extraordinarily stressful to figure it out. I was interested in a lot of things. I was interested in doing a lot of work. And in all honesty, I didn't know where I excelled or where I had specific abilities. I mean, I knew I could do different stuff, but uh, that wasn't very helpful. So it really took time. It took experientially living into the process so that I could um, actually check it out and see like where, okay, what did I enjoy doing? Um, What did clients seem to like best when I did it for them? And over time, I was able to figure out a kind of you know, de facto extrapolated mission. Uh, the way that I say it now, if people ask, is that I, and, and I, I feel very good about this. I feel like this is a goal I can get behind, but I like to say that I work to help, uh, you know, good, good people and good organizations get their message heard in a noisy and crowded environment. And I think in a lot of ways that kind of summarizes the background that I have coming out of marketing and communications and strategy, but that was not something that I brilliantly came up with uh, out of thin air. That was something that I had to figure out by doing a lot of different work for a lot of different clients. Well, in, indeed. And, and now that I hear that, I when I think of the fact that you are on this 10-year project to do a musical, you've done a documentary, you're a reporter, you're writing books, you are also doing what others, so let's just say doing good by getting through in a noisy world with these different types of media. Does that, does that, 
fit into your North Star description? And what's the story, the little story in Dory's mind? Because I think a lot of people, like you say, struggle. I think a lot of, uh, we, we go to universities, we're kind of taught to be curious. Uh, I mean, not everyone has to go to university, but you know, a lot of people have uh, a bandwidth to learn about a lot of stuff, want to do a lot of stuff and have a legacy of, of, of you know, doing, doing good. Uh, then you end up with all, all these projects and some of them don't fall, you know, they, they fall through because you haven't, uh, you know, A, cottoned on to the strength of your connection into it and then allocated the long game strategies that you put in place to make it happen. So I was wondering what, what's the little story in Dory's mind about how she's connected to all these different projects that you've done and are doing. So the way, the way that I think about it is i mean for, first of all uh part of what animated my writing of the long game really was to share some of the personal philosophies that have developed over time and just kind of how how i think about structuring things and so i these things that i talk about in the book really are principles that i employ in my day-to-day -day life so in terms of optimizing for interesting uh just to give one example I am in the process of attempting to pursue, this is not an easy process, uh, Italian citizenship, which Ooh. I actually qualify for. Uh, I found out years ago I qualified for it, and it has been painstaking, Minter, just to, you know, this goes back generations, and to figure out who is connected to who. And, you know, if you get far back enough, um, at least in a lot of families that are not super genealogically oriented, you can really hit a lot of roadblocks. You know, now it's a little bit easier with, you know, very specific databases on things like ancestry.com. But I mean, for years I've been pursuing things and it's like, oh, well, we can't find this birth certificate. Why can't we find this birth certificate? And it's, oh, well, she was Paper. born in this town, not that town. And somebody screwed it up. And, you know, there's, there's different challenges. Um, literally right now I am having to mount a lawsuit. This is the most preposterous thing in the entire world, but in order to change, in order to change, um, my, uh, great, great grandmother's name, which was erroneously rendered on my great grandfather's marriage certificate. Uh, I actually have to file a lawsuit in Massachusetts. So I'm paying to do that. It's all preposterous, but 10 years ago, I decided it would be interesting to become an Italian citizen. So I'm doing it. it, you know, it gives me something fun to think about, something fun to talk about. And, you know, and also, of course, there are benefits. It gives you geopolitical optionality. Uh, it gives you the opportunity to potentially work or live in different places. So there's, there's all kinds of benefits, but the primary one is, hey, that would be a really interesting thing to do. So that's part of how I think about my activities. Also, the other frame that I use, which I also talk about in the long game, is the concept of 20% time. And this is something that was popularized by Google. They have over the years encouraged their employees to spend up to 20% of their time focusing on a more speculative or long range uh, project that is outside the scope of their day-to-day -day job description. And I think this is some, this is a really great idea. You know, even, you know, large numbers of Google employees don't even do this because it takes work. It takes work and effort to, you know, to fight for it because the easier path is just like, oh yeah, well, okay, I'll just use it to answer emails or, oh yeah, well, I guess I need to have a meeting with you. So I'll have a meeting on this day. Uh, but, you know, you really have to fight to carve it out. But I think it's valuable for all of us, whether we work inside a company or we work for ourselves. And so to your point, I have been focusing for the past five years, my 20% time on learning to write musicals. And so my goal, which I set in 2016, was to write a musical that would be uh, on Broadway by the 2026 season. So that's uh, that's what I'm working on. Well. And the 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 way you describe how that you, your the way you've gone about it, I thought very illuminating. By, for example, investing in shows, so that's a, a do. You're doing the investing, which shows you, you figure out the financing part of that because you might not have had enough of you know what does it take to make a show. All right, then there's the writing, and you you start looking at what are successful, what goes into or whatever one wants to call successful, assuming you know, it's the number of people that go see it kind of thing and like it, presumably. But um, I thought that that was really illuminating. 
and uh, and and all the more power to you. It, it strikes me that in the I don't know how many years since Vince introduced us um, that I've oh I feel we like- well we've I I think it was it was at a minimum it was it was either 2011 or 2013. So it was at a minimum 2013. So I think it's eight plus years. Yeah, it's beautiful. Well, I, I've been, been enjoying this journey with you, Dory, and, and seeing you uh, move along. So um, right now, uh, what I, the, the other thing which I, I find interesting is, is now you got from this optimizing for interesting, optimizing for meaning. As you go through your projects, how much do you then retrofit meaning into them do, do you go back and say well that, that fitted in or does it is it okay just to let that you know that that boat pass well i think i i wouldn't necessarily worry too much about uh retrofitting meaning onto things where it doesn't naturally fit mm -hmm. but it is interesting of course how time shakes out and you can see elements that you couldn't see before so, you know, the hackneyed example is, oh, Steve Jobs took the calligraphy class and years later he right. put the fonts in the computer, you know, so I mean, there's that. But, you know, just to give you one example from my own life, um, for years, you know, one of the, the thing that I did, the first thing that I did after I finished my undergraduate education was I went to uh, divinity school and I got a master's degree from Harvard Divinity School in theological studies. And that is something that I think if we are talking about a linear life path, doesn't necessarily make sense to a lot of people. You know, the first question that the more pragmatically minded would say is, well, you know, what do you do with that? How do you use that? And, you know, the literal What's answer the business is- business model? Yeah, exactly. The literal answer is like, uh, well, I mean, not really, <laughs> but uh, I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not a minister, I'm not a theologian. So no, I'm not using that every day, but, it really wasn't until years later that it actually kind of clicked into place with the work that I ended up doing that I came to understand that actually there is a through line. And that through line is that in, you know, I have always been interested in questions about meaning and mm -hmm. meaning making. Like, how is it that people make sense of their lives and there's their sort of place in the universe, the thing that they're trying to do or, you know, the, the sort of teleological ends. And uh, in contemporary society, work is really the method through which most Western people do that. That is, that is how we express our identity. That's the, you know, the first thing we ask when we meet each other. That is the way that, uh, that a lot of people make sense of their contribution in the world. And one can argue, you know, for better or for worse, that's the case, but I think it is largely the case. And so in many ways, my study of religion is not dissimilar to and, and is not that far from the work that I do now, which I, I see largely as helping people figure out how to optimize what is our contemporary locus of meaning in the workplace. Hmm. It's funny, I, I was um, in Rome, you are soon to be a new patria, um, talking to a 31 year old priest who had been studying uh, at the uh, Vatican, they have a Vatican University, I had no idea. And he was talking about, this was fascinating, about the uh, impact of technologies over the centuries to impact our thinking, how we're wired. And uh, he was referring to in, in his homily at the wedding to um, how we can be wired for Microsoft or Apple or uh, God forbid Linux. I say, God forbid, I, I, maybe that was a little bit too much in the old, uh, in the religious bike uh, part. But um, that, that, that's interesting, this notion of, of, of coming back to something you did. I think that's also a type of thing that we don't do enough of, which is like you were saying, oh, I, I'm interested in food, right? And then you start picking up the, the breadcrumbs of interest and meaning in the food. You went to theological school, then you start picking up the breadcrumbs of finding and giving meaning uh, to people and, and so on. So I, I do find that that's a, it was a, a lovely little uh, unexpected little uh, bypass. Um, so in the 20% story, the thing that I keep on running up against is 
the governance model that allows us a to have 20% and b to think long term and if if you don't have a good grip on what success looks like if it feels like that can corrupt very quickly the governance model that allows you to or pushes you to pavlovianly strip back down to the quick short term and well i just got to do what i got to do yeah i i think that's a a really good point mentor absolutely i mean we need to understand at a fundamental level that we're running our own race and we are going to end up fairly dissatisfied if we are at the end of our lives and we have optimized for an outcome and even succeeded at that outcome if it is not really the outcome that we want. And so um, it can be challenging to unpack all of that, but I think it's pretty high stakes and pretty important to be able to, to do that and to understand that, you know, yeah, of course, it would be more efficient, quote unquote, if we were always in sprint mode or if we were always focused on optimizing our professional development. But if we think about a topic that I talk about in the long game, which I call thinking in waves, we realize, you know, yes, sure, we we do have to sprint sometimes. You know, there, you know, I'm I'm in the thick of a book launch right now for the long game. I would be irresponsible if I were not sprinting toward the launch. And also, we are not robots. We cannot keep that up. It becomes uh, very short sighted to think that you can sprint for more than a select period of time. You need to go from sprint mode to marathon mode, and it's not good to just exist in one of them. Uh, the secret to life, in a lot of ways, is learning to toggle back and forth. Mm -hmm. And 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 it, it does strike me that as you start off in the book about your white space, this this needing to carve out things to allow you to do your twenty percent, and uh, and and think through waves. Uh, how you want to get to where you want to get to. So the, the, the thought then I have is just with regard to 20% the, and the governance model, is there a, uh, an advice or a thought you have as to how to allow for that 20% uh, when we all know we also have to pay bills and have pressures on performance? If you're looking at somebody who's working in a, in a company, uh, is it, does it have to be sort of the side gig, the side hustle? And then maybe the further question is, how do you, within the 20%, or well, decide what you want to do within 20%, uh, connect that into your, your purpose, your North Star? Yeah, so the, these are important points. And you know, the truth is, as we were saying earlier, even a large percentage of Google employees, you know, where the, the company that, that you know, popularized this concept, that right. quote unquote encourages this concept, they don't do it, which is quite telling. And to me, what it says is it's not that it's a bad idea. It's not that it's an ineffective idea, but it is something that is hard to maintain. It's like having an exercise regimen, right? You got to keep refreshing it all the time. You got to keep resisting the pressures. And so Marissa Meyer, who was formerly a Google executive, then went on to become the CEO of Yahoo. She famously said years ago, and this is even a long time ago, when, when she was asked about Google 20% time, she said, ha ha, the secret of Google 20% time is it's 120% time. And, yeah. you know, so according to her, it is nights and weekends. And I think we have to understand the reality of that, that it's true. If you want to actually carve out special designated time for things, it would, it would be selling snake oil to say, oh yeah, you can do all of this so effectively in 35 hours a week. I think people probably need to put in a little extra. I'm not going to lie. Um, and also, it doesn't have to be all the time. And also, there are waves. And let me talk about one more wave, which is the pandemic wave. A lot of people have been very hard on themselves. A lot of colleagues uh, that I know are very disappointed because they feel like they maybe slipped backwards professionally during the pandemic because they had to over-index and spend so much time on childcare or just 
you know, de- dealing with all of the craziness that attends an international pandemic. And I can understand and, and empathize with that feeling for sure, because we all have goals that we're striving toward. And if we, you know, if we don't make them or they don't come on the timeline we want, we get frustrated. But also we have to show ourselves some grace because when there is a global pandemic, really that takes precedence. You know, I feel, I feel fair saying that and life is long and there are other chances to recalibrate, to rebalance your portfolio. You know, you might've had way too much time with your family and your kids right now. Well, you know what? They're going to be sick of you too. And so when, you know, when they do go back to school or when do things do normalize, that's the time to lean in more to the things that you were neglecting later. So there, there are opportunities. The, the secret is it's not that you have to do it all the time, but you do need to do it. And, uh, and also, I will say it doesn't always have to be 120% time. Maybe it's 103% time because if we get smarter about saying no, and creating more white space and avoiding some of the obligations that many of us take on thoughtlessly because we we assume that we don't have room to say no or we assume that we don't have room to renegotiate the terms that people are offering. Um, that's how we get ourselves into trouble sometimes, but we actually oftentimes have more control than we think. In, in the book, you have a, or you see, you have a site on your site, you have a worksheet that talks through that and and it's the idea of looking through your calendar and, and, and doing that work. And of course, hopefully getting down to a point which is more balanced and longer term. It's the first time I certainly, I think on any of my podcasts, I've ever heard someone say life is long, uh, which is a refreshingly different uh, type of statement. Um, one of the things that strikes me when you look at this 20% uh, in the governance model, the, the, the aha moment I'm having, Dory, is that if you, uh, I, rather than think of it like a, you know, like a, a, a principles of 10 principles of Dory Clark or whatever, it's more like, well, if, if family is important to me, then that's part of my governance model. And therefore, I'm not interested in having 16 Maseratis and whatever else. The thing is, I, I want to have the time to spend with my children. And that's what's important. So that's my governing model. That's my governing principle that gets me into the 20%. Otherwise, it can feel uh, like I'm not going to make the money that I need to. Anyway, so I, I, I enjoyed that. Um, I wanted one last uh, zone I wanted to get into. Uh, uh, and I obviously, uh, I encourage everyone to read The Long Game. But I, so I don't want to go through everything that's in the book. But there's another concept I really liked, which is good multitasking. And, um, and, you know, because I think multitasking gets kind of a big rep, reputation, not necessarily good. Uh, and in these days, we are, time is short. And, and, well, you know, life is long, but time is short. It's short supply. Um, it described to us what is good multitasking, because I thought it was very, uh, very elucidating. Yeah, thank you, Minter. So part of my understanding of quote unquote, good multitasking came from some experiments that I did on myself uh, a couple of times in February, 2018. And then again, in December of 2020, I undertook month long experiments where I was doing time tracking. And so for an entire month, I would measure and record all of how I spent my time in 15 minute increments to actually get the data. Like, all right, if I'm voting with my feet here, what am I doing? How am I spending my time? And what does that say about me and my priorities? And something that I discovered in, in both instances, which I thought was fascinating, was, a, I guess, an accounting practice I use, so to speak, with, uh, with this time tracking, is if I was doing two activities at the same time, and you know, if I could legitimately say I was doing them both equally well, you know, not sort of <laughs> like messing something up, but if I was doing two, two things uh, equally well, I would just record them both and count them both. And so, you know, we know bad multitasking, right? It's like you're on a conference call and you're typing an email and you're like, so what do you think, Dory? And you're like, uh, uh, oh, wait, what? <laughs> what was that? <laughs> that yes. would be bad multitasking. Uh -oh. yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
<laughs> um, good multitasking is things that you that are complementary that you actually legitimately can do both, and it's no big deal. You can take a walk and call your mom. You can work out and listen to an audiobook. You can wash the dishes and um, catch up with a friend, or you know whatever it is. And those are things that I counted twice, and I discovered that I actually had gotten pretty good at that type of multitasking. So I had bought myself close to close to 25% more time in my schedule every week because of that. And so that means that, you know, you have to wash the dishes or cook dinner or whatever anyway, but I'm also using that time for professional development. If we were trying to cram everything uh, as one-offs into our 168 hours, you might indeed run out of time. But if you can find a place to add in another activity, it actually makes a lot more things possible. Well, what I feel like it, it needs to break down is one is physical and one is cognitive. Because if you're trying to do two things that are tapping into your cognitive space, that might be harder to allocate. You know, how would, the bigger noise is probably going to attract you know, more attention. But if you're doing a walk that's physical and you're listening to a book that's cognitive, if you're washing the dishes and speaking to a friend, there's a mechanical element and then there's, you know, an affectionate element. And of course, if someone's talking about something really important, drop the dishes. Listen, listen, right? But um, anyway, that's beautiful. Dory, um, what would you like people who have been listening and hopefully all the way to the end, what would they uh, would like, would you, where would you like them to go follow you and obviously get your wonderful new book, The Long Game. Well, Minter, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure talking with you. And as you said, the book is The Long Game, How to Be a Long-Term Thinker in a Short-Term World. You can get it all, all the places one gets books. And you were mentioning, in fact, my self-assessment, which if folks are interested in how to apply the principles of strategic thinking and long-term thinking to their own lives, um, folks can download it for free at doryclark.com slash the long game. Beautiful. Well, I will put all that naturally into the show notes. Uh, wonderful. Good luck with the rest of the launch and uh, keep on doing what you're doing, Dory. You're in great, great energy and uh, I love, I love, uh, enjoyed very much the long game. Thank you so much. Thanks for having listened to this episode of the Minter Dialogue podcast. If you like the show and would like to support me, please consider a donation on patreon.com forward slash Minter Dialogue. You can also subscribe on your favorite podcast service. And as ever, rating and reviews are the real currency for podcasts. You'll find the show notes with over 2,000 and more blog posts on mintodile.com. Check out my documentary film and four books, including my last one, You Lead, How Being Yourself Makes You a Better Leader. And to finish, here's a song I wrote with Stephanie Singer, A Convinced Man.
like the feel of a stranger tucked around me, precipitating the danger to feel free. Trust in my reason and let me show you why. I'm a convinced man practicing my lines. I'm a convinced man here in these confines. A convinced man in the arms of a woman. I'm a convinced man fit to the test. I'm a convinced man. I'm ready for an arrest. I'm a convinced man in the arms of a woman.